Ted. No, not dear Ted, dear you. You, right here, right now. I want you to imagine the thing. Oh, come on, you know the thing. It's, it's that thing you can't stop thinking about. The thing that every browser and every device that you own reminds you you need and want. In fact, it's already in your cart. All you have to do is check out. Are you, are you sure you're not ready to check out? We noticed it's still in your cart. Have you seen the colors, the sizes? It's time to check out. Now I want you to imagine that you do. You've checked out. You receive a confirmation email almost immediately. And with that, the magical tracking number. That's right. Between here and there, between Nebraska and your doorstep, you can know exactly where the thing is as it travels to you. And then one morning, you get the notification, out for delivery. Ha! It's coming! Anxiously, you wait out the window, and then you see it. The postal worker walks, places the parcel down at your doorstep, and you rush to see it. But as you reach for it, you notice something that catches your eye. It's an envelope. It has your name on it in handwriting that you recognize. You don't even need to check the return address, and, and you open it, and there, awaiting you, is a handwritten letter to you from someone you know, someone who knows you. This feeling of anticipation, of excitement, of euphoria at receiving a handwritten letter is something I know well. You see, I grew up in northern New Hampshire. About 35 miles from the Canadian border, we lived at the 45th parallel, halfway between the equator and the North Pole. We lived in a one-room schoolhouse with only wood heat. Most of the roads were not paved. And as my sister and I would spend time playing in our front yard in the summertime, few cars would drive by. But one predictable occurrence would be our postal carrier, out for rural free delivery. My sister and I would always scramble from the grass and rush down to the mailbox where our parents had inscribed on the front, only good news in here. We'd pull open the metal mailbox, grab the mail and run inside to see if anyone had sent us who buddy mail. Now, what I began to learn in my childhood was that there are two directions that mail exists in. I didn't just have to wait for a letter, I could send mail to, to anyone. So what I began to learn is I could look up at the library, the addresses of the sports teams that I followed. We didn't have a TV, but I knew that these people existed, that they had addresses. And so I started to mail letters to my favorite athletes to my favorite authors, to my favorite writers. And some of them wrote me back. To get a letter from someone I admired was unlike anything I'd experienced before. I wrote letters to players on the Boston Celtics, the Chicago White Sox, to writers from Sports Illustrated, and began to get mail back. I even once called the home of Rebecca Lobo, the college basketball star from the University of Connecticut, and asked her mother if it would be okay if I sent her a letter at her home address because I'd found her number in the phone book. She said, sure, but believe it or not, we get a lot of mail, so make sure you embellish that, uh, that envelope really nicely. Note to self, embellish your envelopes. Now, when I grew up and became a middle school teacher, I wanted my students to experience that same power of making someone feel something in their writing. But I was struggling as a young teacher. How could I encourage them in their introduction, their conclusion, to employ a narrative voice that made their reader feel something deeply? The letter. The letter held the key. So now, the first assignment I have my 7th and 8th grade English students do is they write a handwritten letter of gratitude 
to someone who doesn't expect it. This isn't a thank you card for a gift. It isn't the predictable exchange of manners and, and pleasantries. This is to someone who doesn't expect it. Some of my students predictably write to relatives who have given them great pieces of advice. Others write to teachers, friends, coaches, mentors. I had a student write once to Lin-Manuel Miranda to express gratitude for having written Hamilton, a play that meant so much to this student. And Lin wrote back. Now, if you know Lin, of course he wrote back, but this student was so overwhelmed with this second layer of gratitude, seeing his handwriting, seeing that it meant a lot to him to have received the letter too. It doesn't just go one way when you write a letter. Another student once wrote a letter of gratitude to her babysitter, who was from Thailand. She had been with her throughout her whole childhood. And she showed me the letter and said, can I actually have an extension? I think I want to write it in Thai. This was a language the student didn't speak, but she knew if I really want this person to feel something, I can do that with my handwriting. I can take the time, put the energy in, and make it land that much more right here. Now, once you open the door to possibility, you start to see avenues, channels everywhere. So I started realizing I had this other grievance. Most of the feedback I was giving my students was about these quantitative and measurable things that they were doing. These ways that I engaged with them were, were numbers, were feedback. I was seeing so much more as I sought to understand who they were, how I could support them over our 10 months together in the classroom that stretched beyond numbers, beyond reports. So I started writing letters to my students. I challenged myself to write two a day, just a couple sentences, something I noticed that would never make it into their grade report. And I would check their name off on my list, ensuring that each student I taught over the course of a semester would get at least one handwritten note. Could I make those eight minutes in my, in my schedule? Sure. Parents started telling me how much it meant to their child to have gotten a handwritten note, thanking them for something I saw at recess or in the lunchroom. Something I noticed about what a good listener they were. You don't get grades for being a good listener, but teachers notice those things. So how else could I use letters? Where else was there an opportunity to use my handwriting to engage with the humans I interact with each day. Another grievance. At the end of every semester, I would be so frustrated when my students would throw out their notebooks. Ah, these exam review packets, we shared so much here and you're tossing it in the, in the recycling bin? Ah, oh, come on. We did so much together. Those notes, those conversations, they were beautiful. There must be something worth saving. So I decided to turn my exam review packet into a letter. No one will throw out a letter. It ended up becoming a book that I self-published called The Things We Shared in the Time We Had, a letter to my students. I dedicated it to them so they could put it on their bookshelf. Sure, it was the exam review packet and it was a letter, but it also contained all the jokes, all the, all the conversations we'd had. Letters can do that. They can take you back. Now, whenever I talk to my students, there are three questions, three types of questions that we focus on. We talk about the what questions, the so what questions, and the now what questions. Of course, because I teach middle school, there's also the wait, what type questions. We won't talk about those right now. The what of letter writing was in, in that story of my experience. The so what though, how does this happen? Why are letters so much more powerful than a thumb-tapped text message, than an email? What is it about them? Letter writing exists in three different spheres of time. They exist in the past, they exist in the present, and they exist in the future. They exist in the present the same way that literature 
is written about in the literary present. When we are reading page 17 of Macbeth, those things are happening for us in the moment. It is in the present. If you read the final pages of the Harry Potter series in the last book for the first time, it is happening real for you in that moment. Letters do that too. You can revisit that same emotion decades later when you find that letter in the bottom of a shoebox from someone you love. Letters also exist in the past. Letters exist in the past because even though they have the immediacy of reading them now, they can be handed down. I don't imagine that I will be sending my great-grandchildren carbon copies of the emails I received that meant a great deal to me, forwarding along text messages to future generations within my family. But I know that I will be handing off to my children the letters that their parents, my partner and me, exchanged during our courtship. Of course I will. What they choose to do with them is up to them, but that shoebox gets passed down. Letters also exist in the future. Letters exist in the future because we have the opportunity to ask ourselves big questions in letters, to invite the exchange, that level of reciprocity of saying, here is a letter. What might you do with this? Where might this go? It's an invitation to respond, to grab an envelope, to find the stamp, to lick it, to seal it, to take it. It takes effort, but it is so worth it. It is one of a kind. The way a piece of artwork is one of a kind. We don't make a facsimile. We don't photocopy it. We don't save those things. There is one of them. They are priceless when we write a letter. However brief, however short, something lands differently. Something from the middle of the middle of us to the middle of the middle of that other person. One of the most famous letter writers of all time was Emily Dickinson. She wrote her letters to the world, sitting in her bedroom in Western Massachusetts over a hundred years ago. She wrote things like, this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? We might not see the need that each of us has to receive letters, to write letters, to slow down in an age that moves so fast. We are not nobodies, but we all feel like nobodies sometimes. Getting those reminders that we are worth the time it takes to think through a letter, to think through literally each letter that we write lands differently. There's no delete button. We have to slow down. We slow ourselves down when we write them, and we slow down when we read them. So how to end this letter? Where to go from here? I suppose when a letter is passed, it becomes a present that extends into the future. Is that too corny? I've, I've said it. It's permanent. There's no erase button. The letter is passed into the present, becomes a present into the future. I'm now writing up the side of this letter with a postscript here. Sorry for the corniness. If I could have written this speech again, I would have maybe done it differently, but I didn't. So this is my letter to the world. Write back if you have the time. Thank you.